Hi everyone, my name is Abu Bakr Abid. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University, and today I'm going to be talking about contrastive PCA. Contrastive PCA is a technique that we've developed, myself, as well as my colleagues, Martin Zhang and Vivek Bagria, and my advisor, James Zhou. Before I talk about contrastive PCA, let me talk about standard PCA. So principal component analysis is a ubiquitous dimensionality reduction technique. It's used to take high dimensional data. In this case, I have three dimensions, but usually we're working with hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of dimensions. And it's used to project that data down to two or three dimensions where we can visualize the data much more easily. PCA is very useful. It helps us discover important features within the data or linear combinations of features. It helps us discover clusters in the data. Because again, we're bringing the data down to two or three dimensions, so we can easily easily see clusters of data points or clines, which are gradual trends within the data. And in some cases, it helps us understand um, how to compress the data efficiently. Now, but there's a certain limitation, or at least assumption of PCA, and that is that the directions that are of interest to the analyst are those that have the highest variance within the data. And that's how PCA works, right? It looks, uh, it efficiently finds those directions that have the most variation, and it projects the data onto those directions, which we call principal components or PCs. But what if the top PCs are not directions of interest? Right, so let me give an example here. Um, suppose you're working with genetic data um, and you are, uh, you have a bunch of breast cancer patients that you've collected uh, their gene expression profiles. And you are interested in discovering subtypes of breast cancer by doing PCA and seeing how the data clusters. Or maybe, you know, what each cluster corresponds to one sub uh, type of breast cancer. If you end up doing that analysis with PCA, what you might find is that the top PCs don't correspond to some notion of subtypes of breast cancer, but instead correspond to demographic variations, such as race or age or gender, because those are the ones that are responsible for most of the variation in your data. Um, in other cases, oftentimes experimental or technical artifacts can cause tremendous variation in your data and cause the top PCs to reflect that instead of the signal of interest. In other cases, if, you are, if you're collecting data from multiple sensors, if there are correlated sensors, that again can cause uh, PCA to reflect those correlated sensors rather than the, uh, the signal that you're interested in. So because of this, Marcus Ringner writes in a review in Nature Biotech um, that PCA is oftentimes not very useful in identifying subgroups in biological data because dominant principal components correlate with artifacts instead of the signal of, of interest. So we introduced contrastive PCA, and how does that help solve this problem? The basic idea behind contrastive PCA is, let's use two data sets. So what we've seen so far is that the target data set, what we actually want to analyze, contains a direction of interest, but it also contains confounding directions. These are directions that have a high variance, but they're not of interest to us. So what do we do? We bring in a background data set that only contains confounding directions, okay? That only contains those confounding directions that are present in the target data set. And the basic notion, the basic idea behind contrastive PCA is to efficiently find those directions that are enriched in the target data relative to the background. I think this is best illustrated with an example. So let me introduce a uh, data set here. This is a public data set. It consists of protein expression from mice. Um, and the data set consists of 135 measurements from mice that have undergone some sort of shock or stress, th stress therapy. We're going to assume that unknown to the analyst, some of the mice um, have Down syndrome and some of them are healthy. Okay, so these labels are actually provided to us, but for the purpose of this ana analysis, we're going to assume that the, uh, the analyst doesn't know these labels. But because Down syndrome versus healthy is, there's a significant phenotypic difference, we would hope that perhaps PCA would be able to pick up this difference. And even in two dimensions, we are able to visualize 
two different populations, one corresponding to the mice that have Down syndrome and others that are healthy. But when we do PCA from 77 dimensions down to two dimensions, we see no such trends or no such clustering. Pretty much all of the mice um, follow a similar distribution, regardless of whether or not they are healthy or um, have Down syndrome. So this perhaps is not too surprising because it could be that the top PCs correspond to some sort of natural variation, such as age or gender of the mice. So what do we do? We bring in a background data set. And this background data set consists of um, 135 measurements from control mice. These are mice that have not undergone the stress uh, or shock therapy. So they are control mice. And uh, yet at the same time, they do probably contain the sources of natural variation that we're talking about. So they might have uh, different ages or different genders. And so uh, we would expect that this background data set to contain those confounding factors. And perhaps when we look for differences, when we look for what sources of variations are enriched in the target versus the background, we might hope to see Down syndrome uh, versus not Down syndrome uh, be one of those differences. And indeed, that is what, do, what we see. So when we do contrastive PCA, we clearly see do, two different populations, one of which consists of healthy mice and the other mostly consists of those mice that have Down syndrome. So this is just one example. Uh, contrastive PCA is a very general technique. Anytime you have multiple data sets and you are interested in discovering the sources of variation that are enriched in one data set relative to the other or others, you can use contrastive PCA. So just to give a few more examples, so we've seen an example where we have a, a diseased population. And to understand that diseased population a little bit better, we introduce as contrast a healthy population. And so the, again, this healthy population contains natural sources of variations. And so by using that as a background, we can understand the diseased subpopulations better. Um, another example is uh, post-treatment. Oftentimes we wanna understand how different populations uh, responded to treatment. So to eliminate other sources of variation, we can do contrastive PCA with the pre-treatment uh, data. Finally, um, a very interesting example, and we'll uh, show this in the next video, is when you have heterogeneous populations. Oftentimes we have data that's collected from many different groups, and you wanna understand the relationship between those different groups better. Um, but at the same time, you might have intra-group variation as well. So to eliminate that, you can use as background one of the groups, and what this does is it eliminates the intra-group variation, leaving the inter-group variation. Um, and uh, I'll show an example of that soon. But before I end, um, I want to uh, just make one thing clear, which is that the purpose of contrastive PCA is not to discriminate between the target data set and background data set. This is not a supervised learning problem where the goal at the end of the day is, let's come up with the best classifier between these two groups. The goal is to understand the target data set better, to do unsupervised learning on the target data set, but to use as assistance um, the background data. It helps us basically resolve what patterns are important in the target and what patterns are not. So thank you so much for watching this. We have a few more videos where we talk about the applications of contrastive PCA, as well as how it actually works and theoretical properties. So please watch our next videos.